All right, let's get started with the next talk on Pluto.jl by Fonts. Um, yeah, I'll just hand it over. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Fons, and we work on Pluto.jl, a notebook for Julia, meant to be for education. And we are on a mission to make scientific computing more accessible and fun. Um, Pluto, well, Pluto is a notebook that's uh, our core values are reactivity. Our whole notebook is reactive. We find interactivity the most important thing of a programming environment. Uh, we want notebooks to be reproducible by default. If someone sends you an Excel file and you open it, it works. If someone sends you a Photoshop file and you open it, it works. So what happens to notebook files? Uh, we work with Julia, and we actually don't work with Python. And we don't intend to work with Python, because our goal is to pick one language, Julia, which is a fantastic, funny, interesting language, and make the best environment just for that one language. Um, we also focus on education. Uh, we make a notebook environment that's designed to be used for teaching. I want something that first-year students who have never programmed before can pick up. They don't have to deal with pip install, update pip, bash, you know, environment variables. And that's also why we're here today at JupyterCon. Um, I'm not presenting Jupyter, I'm presenting something else. But we went into our own niche, Julia, education, and we made a notebook environment just for that. And um, yeah, we also have some interesting lessons, like things we learned making Pluto, which I think will be super interesting to discuss. And this is, of course, a very exciting audience for me. Finally, it's really easy to install. You can try it in your browser, or you can install Julia. It's free, open source. That's something we truly believe in. There's no paywall, nothing like that. Let me start with a demo. So we have this notebook environment where you have cells where you can write code, like one plus one, uh, or one plus one plus one. And I can assign this to variables, like A and then B. I do A divided by five. And so reactivity means that just like in Excel, in spreadsheets, if I change the value here, B also changes. So Pluto knows that B depends on A, and internally they are linked. This is all automatic. And so this gives me a really nice interactive environment where I can quickly change stuff. Now the second big thing that you might not be used to is the file format. So I save this in my documents folder as jupyter.demo.jl. And .jl is like .py, but for Julia. So it's just a script. We don't have a big file. Here you see the notebook on the left. And on the right, I just opened the text file in a text editor. And this is everything it is. It's 15 lines. There's a bit of stuff at the start, because this is a Pluto notebook, not just a regular script. And there you see the code in my notebook. And you can see when I change this, we just update the file. And I don't know if you've ever done a git diff on the notebook before. Um, but the idea is that small changes in your notebook become small changes in the file. And we have some really funny stuff, like, um, OK, for example, we only have Julia cells. We don't have markdown cells. Because actually, Julia has the string macro. So I can say, let's do some math. Hello. And now this is called a string macro. So this is a string in Julia. But a string macro means we apply the markdown function to the string. And so now I can just hide the code. And there we go. It's literate programming, right? And you see that this markdown is in my notebook file also. Um, some interesting things is let's do uh, 1. And then I write 2. And you see that 1 is at the top, 2 is at the bottom. But if I say, one, and then I add A. Now this depends on A, as you can see. 
And also in the file, we moved it down one place because we know that when you run this notebook file as a script, um, you need to first run A and then the string, right? So we, we have this whole comprehension of how your code should run. We don't have the concept of restart kernel and run all. We just always have the correct state. We even have things like, I don't know if you've done this in the REPL or Jupyter before, but you rename a variable. And now you still have that old one still some in some places in your code. Uh, that's not so great, because when you send it to someone else, this leads to really messy code. So we actually just remove A from the scope. It's no longer there, and now you get errors. So errors are not nice, but a hidden error is worse, right? Now, um, so interactivity means I want to interact with my computer within one second. I want to try stuff. And a big one is just changing code. Uh, another one is to use things like sliders and buttons. And for this, um, <clears throat> okay. there's a package pudu UI. Um, let's do the length of text. And so the first type of interactivity is just that I change code and I see my results change. The second type is that instead of assigning to a variable, I bind a variable to an input. So now when I type something, hello everyone, you see that while I'm typing, it's updating this global variable. And this is just, if I look at the type, it's just a string, there's no magic thing that you need to learn about. There's no event loops or blah, blah, blah. You can just use it. So this I find pretty cool. Um, I prepared something. We could do some natural language processing here. So let's look at the letters. So hello, and all of these updates, right? I don't need to worry about where I put my cells because Pluto knows how to run stuff. Um, and I wanted to look at vowels. So I have a function whether something is a vowel. So it should be one of these letters. And I can test this function. So the letter R should not be a vowel, but E should be a vowel. So that's nice. Um, is vowel. Yeah, so now I can count in my text. For example, my name has one vowel. Pluto has two vowels. And I can put this in Markdown. So I can say, your text is, and then I interpolate text. Really nice. And then I say, this has This many vowels, and I can, okay, let's put this package input at the bottom, uh, add some space, hide the codes, say, behind the scenes. I can hide this, hide this, move it to the top, and there you go, I have an app where I can, that helps me play Scrabble or whatever. And while I was doing this, you see that it was just updating the file. And the whole time, I had a script that I can import in my package. I can run it in the REPL. I can import it in Jupyter, use it in my scope. I can import it in another Pluto notebook. All of this works. There are no packages to turn notebooks into scripts. Notebooks are scripts. So yeah, first half of my demo. Uh, I'm doing well on time. That's great. So what is Pluto? Our mission is to make scientific computing more accessible and fun. I think so many young people who are interested in science are being turned away because of terminals, because of installers that don't work, environment variables that are wrong. Uh, we need to fix this. And I believe that scientific computing can be really fun. I'm sure you've seen some visualizations online with graphs. 3D graphics, interactions, and you think, oh, this is great. 
Um, but maybe you also think, I don't have the skills to make these tools myself, especially as a teacher. You often look at nice visualizations, but you don't think like that's within your own reach, not something I can use in my class. But we think this should be in everyone's reach. So quick facts, we are an educational notebook for Julia, not for Python, only Julia. We are written in Julia and JavaScript. We're not like a Jupyter kernel or something, it's really a new project. Uh, started in 2020, and it's developed alongside of a course we are teaching at MIT called uh, Computational Thinking. Um, there we use it as a book, as the lecture notes, and so students can be at home playing with our material. Um, our inspirations are Jupiter, Jupiter pioneered, Interactive computing and scientific computing. This is fantastic. And Observable is a notebook for JavaScript that took a lot of these reactivity concepts and provided it for the masses for the first time. And Observable is on the web. If someone doesn't know Observable, look it up. It's really, I mean, to me, it's mind blowing. And then Excel, the only, I mean, it's really the only programming environment that managed to reach everyone. Um, when we invented computers, we thought everyone will use computers for all of the tasks that they need to... Because computers used to be the size of this room, right? And people started thinking, well, they're getting smaller. Maybe one day they can fit in a living room. Imagine that. And then we can start automating all of these things. But what ended up happening is that we have little televisions, uh, communication devices, and PDF readers. But not many people actually do computation, computation on their computers. Except Excel, right? People use Excel. So what did Excel do that we didn't? In numbers, we are the most popular Julia package. Uh, we have around 100 hours of active views per hour. And our lectures have almost 2 million views on YouTube because we got Thribu Van Brown, uh, Grant Sanderson, the famous YouTuber to use our stuff. <laughs> it's really nice to get someone famous. All right, part two of the demo. I want to show some more stuff. Um, yeah, so we looked at the file format, right? So this is how, you, how your notebook is stored. And if you put it on email or Google Drive or Git, this is the file you have. But often, you also want to share results. So. We have these export options. The notebook file is what you already saw. And then HTML and PDF is pretty much the same, but HTML is the most exciting. Ah, HTML. And so now I have an isolated little file. You don't need Julia installed or whatever. You can open this on your phone. So imagine we went to another computer, and I emailed this, and now we opened this file, right? So this is what you would see. Um, you see that sort of all the IDE features, the typing, the documentation, it's all gone. You just see the notebook. And um, yeah, you can read this. It's not interactive anymore, because this is now a static document. Um, but something that I find really important is if you have a document generated by computation, you should be able to see that computation and run it. So every export has this button, edit or run. And there, you can either download the original notebook file out of the HTML. So we sort of put the notebook file in the HTML, and you can extract it out. Or you can run it on Binder. And this will, without leaving the page, start Binder in the background, connect you to that kernel, run all the cells, and it will work. Uh, I think because of this conference, Binder is having some issues, because all of us are using Binder. So. I don't know. I will add a notification when it's actually no, I mean you believe it, right? This will work. Yeah, yeah. This is a great demo. Uh I'm gonna add some stuff to this demo. So um actually I tried to keep my demo super simple. I could have prepared the CSV file, 3D plots, all of that, but I want you to use your imagination. I'm just showing strings, numbers, addition, counting. But of course, you do, can do quite a lot more with this. So I'm importing the plots package. 
giving a little warning, but that's okay, just about a global variable. Um, so we have the letters, right? Which is a vector of characters. And I want to do a dictionary where for each letter I do burp. I count how many times that letter occurs. So F two times, A two times. And this is, of course, interactive because everything should be interactive. You see, if I type more Fs, Fs the count goes up. And let me plot this. So plot.bar. Also, we have documentation. I forgot to show this, but while you type, like everything you type, you see documentation for. So students just leave this window open. And then as they are working, you can just always read documentation. This is not a separate window. Um, so plots.bar. And then I'm just putting in the dictionary. The first time always takes a little while in Julia. But that's OK. Let's make it smaller. That's pretty nice. OK. <clears throat> so now this is also interactive. That's pretty cool, right? Um, and again, I didn't use any new tools to create this interaction. I just have globals. Every global is interactive. And I chose to bind this text to a text field. And this one indirectly, so depends on counts. Counts depends on letters. Letters depends on text. And that's how this interaction works. Maybe there's something people want me to try, because I sort of forget what's new and what isn't. But um, if you have something that I should try while I have this open. Right. So in the text file, Exactly, this is the thing with Jupyter, right? You do one plot and you have megabytes. But no, it's still this big. Um, so the plot looks like, so we do bind, text, and you see the order changed, right? Because we first need text, then we need letters, then counts, and this is the plot. And actually here you see something new. I added two packages. I didn't install these packages before on my computer. I can actually install every package. And so with autocomplete, like for what I can import, these are all the packages and all of them work. So, so I don't want to choose a package that's super big and then blow up my demo. But for example, this one, I happen to know, but I didn't install it. Click, run it, and just by doing that, it added it to my environment. The environment is stored in my notebook. So here I stored the versions of all the dependencies, but also the versions of all the indirect dependencies. So the dependencies of HyperScript, they're also all version pinned. And this is what I talked about, right? You get an Excel file, it works. And if you get a Pluto file, it also works, because when you open a Pluto notebook, it will first look at these two things that are normally hidden away from users. You never see this. And we will use it to exactly reproduce the environment that your friend made the notebook with. Nice. Um, there's one more demo I wanted to show, actually, before I talk about reproducibility. So um, you saw the HTML export. There's also a recording where when I start the recording, I can start doing stuff, like adding a cell, removing cells. And I can also work with my interactions, say, hello, fonts, that's me. And I can scroll around, see how things work. And just like Zoom or whatever, I made a video recording, but it's not an MP4 file. It's an HTML file, just like the one before. So. I can send this to someone, and uh, let's say they have a much smaller screen, right? So I'm zooming in to simulate that. I can play this video where 
when I start the recording, I can start doing stuff like adding cell, removing cells. And I can also work with my directions, say hello, things. And I can scroll around, see how things work. I can go back in time. And while I'm watching this, where when I start the recording, I can start doing I, stuff. I might scroll away and see how things work. And it automatically pauses. The whole thing is gone. This is something you cannot do with an MP4 file, right? I can see, hey, actually, how does that work? Look at this stuff. And then I say, all right, back to recording. Like adding cell. It scrolls back to the screen where it was recording, and it's synchronized again. And this is a recording where I can say, Hey, this is interesting. Let me run it. It's pretty cool, right? OK. Demo. Demo, demo, demo. All right, so reproducibility. Uh, notebooks should be reproducible by default, just like Excel. Don't give this up to get more features or something. Um, and how do we do this? First of all, our package manager. Our entire environment description is stored in the notebook file. And every notebook file, if you get a Pluto notebook, you can run it. You don't need to work with the terminal. Modification, so adding packages, removing packages, it's all automatic. So we don't want you to ever work with pip or, you know. Um, it's all handled automatically. Or we have buttons where you can click for updating. Then we run everything in an isolated environment. So. We have like a pip virtual environment for every notebook. But in Julia, this is super fast because Julia stores everything globally instead of in a virtual environment. Um, then our runtime, we have reactivity, so no global scope. You never need to restart the kernel and run all. Pluto has pretty much no configuration of the runtime. So you cannot have settings that change something, then give the notebook to someone else, and they forgot to set those settings. You just don't have those settings. There's nothing you can misconfigure because there's nothing you can configure. We don't have plugins that can change something because, again, this would be bad for reproducibility. If you want plugins, you can just make them a Julia package, and they will be handled by Pluto. Then we want executable documents. Notebook sources are always included in HTML exports. And every HTML export has a binder button. Even if you don't have a GitHub account, you can already use this. Um, some lessons that we learned. I have a lot, but you know, I will just do a couple. We have a very unique position, right? We only work with Julia. We have a very specific target audience, education. If someone says, I want Vim support, I want advanced key bindings, I want you know, AWS S3 integration, we say, yeah, it's not within our scope, so we don't work on it. And this means that Pluto is not the right tool for everyone. Because people can still use Jupyter VS Code, the REPL. But for our target audience, we try to do the best thing we can. And when we started, Jupyter was already there. So we didn't need to make everyone happy because everyone was already happy with Jupyter. So first lesson, interactivity can be really accessible. It doesn't need to be a fancy skill or a fancy package. We find that people of all coding levels use it, like it, and they get a lot of value out of it. People use this for teaching. Uh, we had a presentation from someone in Indonesia designing bridges who made a notebook where you can have sliders for the size of your bridge. And this, uh, he didn't need to buy MATLAB for all of his students anymore. They could just all go to his website on Chromebooks, iPads, and design a bridge. It saved him so much time and money. Um, and interactivity, we mean two types. There's code, just typing code, seeing results. And there's the GUI, which looks the fanciest on a presentation like this. But the GUI is the same programming idea as the code. Right? We don't have, you suddenly need to go to a for loop or something. It's still global. Um, making our own app, our own JavaScript front end. Front end means a browser application makes us so creative, we can just try whatever and release it or not release it. And there's so many things we can try. Uh, I took a random selection of things for my you know, recording screenshots folder. 
Um, this is really fun. It's really nice to work on programming environments. We even have sliders within code. I don't know if Jupyter can do that. Um, having a single language makes you really creative. You never need to worry about is this supported on R, Python. Um, and we can really integrate with Julia because all of our thing is written in Julia. So we have the same code everywhere and it all understands each other. Uh, big appreciation for Binder, CB, and Jupyter Lite. Um, we realize that the web is the most important platform. Um, you need to reach people where they are, and they are on the same device as TikTok, and only the web runs on that device. So if you use tools like Binder, CB, and Jupyter Lite, then you can suddenly reach people and teach science. Um, code should be a communication tool, not something that you use in the background, make nice results. Uh, this is how we explain math 200 years ago. And now we have a nice color screen to look at the PDF, you know? Um, I'm very honored to work with a very large group of creative and amazing people. Some of them are here today. Hmm? Um, very grateful also for the Jupyter ecosystem for making scientific computing accessible to everyone. And that's it. Thank you so much. One or two questions, I guess. Go ahead. About Jupyter Light and Pluto, I guess, right? Um, no, because Julia doesn't have really good WebAssembly support. I mentioned it. I forgot to say. We use Binder and CB, and we are super jealous of Jupyter Light, and we wish it was also so nice for Julia. But no, we don't use it. We cannot use it. Yeah. Um, about reusing some of the technology for other languages. It's something we didn't think about on purpose, just to stay focused, make something quick. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I, it's also just so nice to make this stuff. I'm sure everyone would have a nice time making it in a different language. But for Jupyter, which is a polyglot environment, it's nice to have um, a reactivity system that new languages can quickly hook into, right? This is something, yeah, we should talk about this offline, but it is something we, we discussed with Next Journal, and they experimented with this a bit. They also make a polyglot notebook where your R code becomes reactive into Julia. But then we say R scope is first time learners, and they are not polyglot programmers, you know, so. But it is, I mean, mathematically super exciting, of course. Yeah. Thanks.